All right. So I think we're ready to get started. You all can see on, on the shared screen our agenda for this morning. I'm really grateful that all of you are interested and here and have joined us. I think it's going to be a fabulous discussion. We have three wonderful presenters that are going to be part of our panel discussion. Um, I'm going to let them introduce themselves because they, they're going to be better at it than I am. Um, so we are going to start the discussion. I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing. And just remind everybody to stay on mute um, until we get to the discussion phase of the, of of the presentation and then you are welcome to turn on your video and come off mute and have an interactive conversation with us. Um, you can, in the meantime, you can put all of your comments and or questions in the chat. I'll be monitoring it. Um, if you want to pin one of the speakers so that you get a better view, you can do that with the three little, the sideways snowman. If you hover over someone's picture, you can do that with that functionality. So, so welcome and um, I'm excited to have you. So we're gonna start off the panel discussion. Each of our presenters are gonna spend a few minutes speaking to their body of expertise. Um, and then we're gonna have an open discussion. So John Wortman is joining us from Esri. John, would you go ahead and introduce yourself and, um, and start our discussion? Yeah, thanks so much, Jenna. It's really a delight to be here, and I appreciate the invitation. Uh, good to be with Bill and David on the on the panel today. So I am the uh, the policy manager on Esri's national government federal team. Um, I'm based in the company's Washington D.C. office, uh, which is in Tyson's Corner, Virginia. For those of you who know the uh, the D.C. area, um, I've been with Esri about three and a half, uh, going on four years. Uh, I spent the previous uh, almost 15 years with the uh, American Association of Geographers, also as their uh, director of government relations. Um, and uh, I've also done various work uh, in federal and state government. Um, so very pleased to be here. And um, I'm just going to try to take maybe five to seven minutes to sort of set the stage for the major federal bills that have passed in the last few years. That are providing the context for this discussion. Um, you know, we've seen an unprecedented period of federal investment in state and local governments, and it's really provided an incredible opportunity for, uh, you know, states to really sort of reshape the way they do business, uh, provide new services to constituents. Um, but it's also providing an incredible opportunity for the people who work in states and localities to really seize this opportunity. To bring sort of their, uh, you know, their work, their passion to the fore um, by encouraging investment in in new technological areas, new opportunities, and really bringing a new era to the way states and localities do business uh, and work with the public they serve. Um, so, you know, the beginning of this story obviously goes back uh, to the to the outbreak of the the terrible coronavirus and. Uh, you know, when, when the disease hit back in 2020, you know, really was in part the geographic community that started to work to help the public understand what COVID was, uh, how it was spreading and what the implications were might be uh, for uh, the United States and broader international communities. I'm sure everyone by now has seen the dashboard that Johns Hopkins put together the ubiquitous red dots became sort of the telling manner of how people would come to understand the spread of COVID. And, um, you know, that was something that was done independently by the university, but they did it on Esri technology and they very quickly reached out to us for our help. And, uh, you know, I think by now the, the COVID dashboard through Hopkins and the various sub uh, dashboards within it have received well over three or 4 trillion views around the world. Um, so it really has been almost a geographic story as the public has come to understand COVID. And, you know, once the disease did break out, the federal government uh, obviously had to spring to action. You know, communities were hemorrhaging funds. Um, people were losing jobs. Industries were being radically transformed, uh, you know, almost day by day because of the fact that we couldn't really interact with each other as a society anymore. 
And as a result of that, the first major investment that uh, transpired as a result of the COVID response was the CARES Act. And it was passed in March of 2020. Uh, the Trump administration put it together with Congress and uh, the Trump administration, because they were still in office, had the ability to shape a lot of the implementation of that law. And, you know, it really was done uh, in a way that did, did provide a lot of uh, flexibility to various industries, but it also provided $150 billion of direct funding to states. Um, and, you know, that was sort of really the first taste of uh, direct investment that state and local governments got from uh, the federal government as a result of what we've seen with the pandemic. Um, you know, the one major difference uh, that I'm going to try to to make clear in my comments is uh, there there are significant different uh, impacts between the CARES Act and the other bills I will talk about. Because for CARES, the Trump administration did put the Treasury guidelines in place that the states and localities have to be responsive to when spending that money. Um, the Trump administration was a little more stringent um, or, you know, they did put a, a few more controls in place for how states could uh, allocate those funds. And the period for CARES expenditures actually expired uh, at the end of December of 2021. So we're now fully outside the period when CARES money is being expended. Um, but, you know, ultimately, you know, in working with a lot of state and local governments and a lot of states did choose to send some of their allocations uh, under CARES directly to various localities. And some of the larger localities did get funding directly from the federal government uh, because of the way the specific regulations were put in place. Uh, if you were a large locality of a particular size, you could get some of your funding directly. Uh, so, for example, I'm a Virginia resident um, in, in Virginia, Fairfax County, which is obviously a huge locality, was able to get some of its CARES funding directly from the government. Uh, but most of the money in the case of CARES went to state governments. Um, and, you know, with the guidance we saw under that, there was, you know, rules that were put into place so that if a state or locality had a specific project they wanted to invest in, uh, in most cases, there could be a good justification for why, you know, geospatial technology mapping products uh, would be justifiable under CARES as a uh, important expenditure. Um, you know, obviously, states uh, needed to work with their health departments to quickly understand how COVID was spreading about communities. Um, how people were being impacted in various geographic areas within their, uh, you know, area of control. And so, you know, most states and localities found that it was easy to put together a justification that certainly uh, included reasons why investments in geospatial software and technology was important. Um, you know, there were some issues here and there. Uh, if localities were interested in doing a project that, you know, strayed a little bit from the direct COVID mission. Uh, but for the most part, from the conversations we had within Esri, our partner community, uh, with our friends in NISJIC and more broadly, we found that, that there was pretty good, uh, you know, ability to justify uh, CARES Act expenditures around geospatial technologies. Um, you know, jump forward to the election in 2020. Uh, we then obviously had the Biden administration come in, in in 2021 and, you know, they saw still at that time because vaccines were just getting rolled out uh, and there was still a significant disruption to the American economy that they needed to uh, do another round of investment in American communities. And that uh, bill became the ARPA program, the American Recovery uh, Program and Act. And uh, out of ARPA, we actually saw an even greater uh, amount of funding that went to states and localities. Um, there was a total of 350 billion allocated under ARPA, and uh, the states received the majority of that money. It was 195.3 billion went to states, and the remainder went to localities, uh, territories, and tribal governments. And you know there was a direct spelled out allocation for each state under ARPA. And I just looked up the, the number this morning. Many of you are probably familiar with this. Arizona got 4.2 billion under ARPA. 
And uh, based on the uh, information I was able to look up, about 1.5 or a little bit uh, higher number than that has been allocated under um, the, uh, the the money that went to the state of Arizona. And the, the federal government under ARPA is actually rolling those funds out in two tranches. So we had one tranche that went in May of last year, uh, a couple of months after the, the bill was enacted. And the second tranche of funding should go uh, in about a month or two to state and local governments. And, you know, with that investment, uh, because the Biden administration was in place and was able to develop the regulations for how the, the funding could be spent, there was a lot sort of wider latitude for how states and localities could expend those funds. And we've actually seen a broad range of programs that uh, governments had been able to put their funding into. Uh, you know, just looking at the allocations that Arizona has uh, expended so far, a lot of course has gone to their uh, programs around, you know, workers who found themselves uh, out of a profession for a while because of the COVID pandemic. There was a significant investment through the governor's uh, office into education programs, and the state has invested over $100 million in broadband funding, which of course has a very clear linkage to uh, geographic understanding. Uh, and what geospatial technologies can do for uh, state and local governments. Um, so we've seen continued investment through the ARPA program. That second tranche will be going out uh, soon from the treasury to states and localities. And you know these intergovernmental organizations have uh, until the end of 2024 to allocate any ARPA funds that they want to expend. And you know beyond that, then all monies need to finally be. Uh, fully appropriated and expended by 2026. Um, you know, it, it's been interesting watching the states and localities deal with their funding programs. In some states under their constitutions, the governor's offices were able to direct this activity directly. Uh, and there was a lot more flexibility in them doing so. They could quickly implement programs, get money to departments, allocate money to various localities as they saw fit. Uh, and put regulations in place themselves that they saw sort of as best practice in directing their partners in how the money should be spent uh, within their jurisdictions. In other states, the state constitution directed that the state legislature had to get involved and actually pass an appropriations bill uh, to expend these federal funds that came from CARES and ARPA. Um, so we've seen various models around the country and, you know, in working with local governments with state governments when there's a desire to expend funds on geospatial investments. Uh, it's often just required a little bit of flexibility, a little bit of uh, exchange with the people uh, who you're dealing with in a, in a relevant agency to figure out, you know, what guidance they've received from the people above them and, you know, how they think something can be best tailored uh, to, to make, make an expense allowable under the guidance that they have. Um, you know, the final thing that I want to mention before I turn it back to Jenna, um, the major investment we've seen, of course, since ARPA has come in the form of infrastructure funding. And that major bill was enacted in November of last year. Uh, it's now been in effect for almost six months, but it wasn't until the omnibus appropriations bill was passed by Congress in March that the full funding for the infrastructure program was actually allocated by Congress. And so uh, we're now in the period where the US Department of Transportation, uh, the Department of Commerce for Broadband, a number of other federal programs and agencies are really starting, uh, starting to put the regulations in place, the programs, uh, and get that money rolled out to state and local governments. And, um, you know, it's going to be really interesting to watch the infrastructure implementation. Um, the uh, you know the major aspects of it I think that are going to be key for geographic uh, folks to play in and uh, anybody who works in a geography program and a, a NISGIC type related program around state government uh, you're going to obviously be focused on the broadband components as as we've mentioned already those are going to be huge areas um, but but a major major one that a lot of people are paying attention to in Washington is permitting for these programs um, you know if you think about all the environmental concerns, the uh, reflection of historical uh, issues that, that need to be uh, looked at when any big project is, is being approved, 
uh, endangered species, um, you know, need for investment based on community growth, demographic factors. These are all huge significant areas that geographic software can provide very clear guidance to states and localities on. And so, uh, you know, perhaps even more so than the CARES and ARPA funding, the infrastructure program is gonna be a major, major area where uh, folks with geographic expertise and training uh, will play a vital role in informing their states and, and local uh, employers on, on how a bill should be rolled out. So this is, uh, you know, a challenging time, but an exciting time for uh, the geographic community. Um, we at Esri have been very pleased to be able to work with so many of you as, as terrific partners. Um, again, I'm, I'm delighted to have this opportunity today with, uh, with Jenna and my fellow panelists, and I think I'll turn it back with that, but I very much look forward to the questions and discussion. Thanks, John, and I appreciate you setting the stage. I know there's a lot of money and um, a lot of opportunity for uh, receiving some support from the federal government. So we're all very much interested in your expertise and how how we can use that to better our program. So I appreciate you being here. And um, we're gonna turn it over to Bill Johnson. Bill is from AppGeo and is widely known as a Carpe Geo evangelist. Um, so it's a fabulous title and, and one that I think only he gets to to have. So, Bill, would you give us a, a little introduction? And I will give you permission to share your slides. So, all right. Thank you very much, Jenna. And uh, really glad to be back with uh, the Arizona crowd. I have very fond memories of being there in Prescott a couple of years ago uh, at your conference. Um, so, yeah, uh, I'm um, I'm going to be talking about the broadband aspects of, of the available federal funding. But just to give you a little bit of background on why I'm going to be talking about broadband, I. Uh, some of you know I was the state GIO for the state of New York. I spent a 31-year career in the state of New York, um, and among the many projects I worked on was uh, the uh, the broadband funding, uh, the broadband program that was funded by NTIA uh, grants so from 2009 to 14. I, so I led the effort in New York, and that was my first exposure to broadband work. And really, among all the projects I was involved with over the, that career in New York, the broadband program was my favorite of all of them. It kind of combined everything, some interesting mapping problems. It was something important to virtually every citizen. It was a nice intersection of technology and policy because we were supporting policymakers, kind of making new decisions in a in a new area. So it was really, really a great thing. And when I retired from the state, I went to Washington, D.C., and I was working on national broadband issues uh, for a nonprofit associated with the FCC for a couple of years. And uh, now that I'm at AppGeo, I'm leading our, our team of uh, work uh, at the state level in broadband. And... Um, we got we're working in several states. In fact, we just learned uh, yesterday that we won another state project. So I'm very happy about that. Um, so anyway, let me see if I can share my deck here. Uh, I have a, a brief deck that I used um, uh, about a month or six weeks ago at the NISJIC conference. Let's see here. Want to play? Do do do. Where do I? Here it is. I can present. Okay, so um, yeah, it's a it's a totally good news story um, uh, with what's going on with this federal funding and how it intersects what we all do as geospatial professionals. So the first part of the good news is there's a lot of money. It's unprecedented levels of money. As uh, John was describing, the ARPA funds that are already on the street, uh, 350 billion out to the states and locals. Um, there was a special category of infrastructure eligibility that included water, wastewater, and broadband. Uh, and so projects are, are being funded with that. Um, and then the, the new money that uh, we're awaiting the notice of funding opportunity in about a month from now, a month from tomorrow, actually, uh, they'll have all the details about how, you, how states uh, will be able to use that, that new money, uh, which is a total of $65 billion that was in the Infrastructure Act. Uh, and these things are additive to the money that's already out there. Um, there's, there's for more than a decade, the uh, FCC has had a universal service program that's about five billion a year that's all directed to broadband activities in four programs. And that's what I was working on when the two years I was in DC. 
And the Department of uh, Agriculture has something called the, the RUS program, the Rural Utility Service Program, which is a combination of low interest loans and grants for broadband projects. And lots of states have allocated from their own budgets uh, work to do broadband because it's a, comp it's a competitive situation. Every state wants to improve their uh, their ability to um, attract uh, you know people moving there uh, and also businesses and you need high speed internet for all of that. So the other part of the good news is this is the first time that I can ever recall where uh, the the way the funds are being allocated and distributed is all based on GIS data. And this this is just think about that. We're talking about the, in this infrastructure act. The funding formulas that determine how much money each state is going to be based on the new FCC broadband map, and then individual pro uh, projects that you want to apply for uh, sub grants under the state programs, the eligibility determinations are also going to be made on GIS data from that same FCC broadband map. And in addition to that, the ARPA funds um, to qualify for broadband infrastructure projects, you need GIS data that proves that the area is unserved at uh, less than 25.3. So we're talking about a huge amount of new money and its eligibility is all totally connected to GIS. And this, that's just amazing to me. Um, so I don't want to spend too much time talking about ARPA because it's it's kind of yesterday's news. The money's on the street. The states have wide discretion on how to spend it. It's kind of shorter term money. The money all has to be spent the, uh, by the end of 25. Uh, and uh, so it's kind of, it's being used for kind of shovel ready projects in the main. Uh, so I want to not uh, dwell on that. Let's move to the infrastructure uh, act. Um, and there's two big pieces in the Infrastructure Act that relate to broadband. One is this thing called the BEAD program, the Broadband Equity Access and Deployment, BEAD. You're going to see that over and over again. This is uh, going to be run by Commerce through the NTIA, which is part of Commerce. And it's essentially a block grant to the state. So states are going to, based on a formula, and the formula is not available yet because it's going to require the new FCC broadband map, which isn't expected until the end of 22. Um, and that map will allow the uh, NTIA to calculate the state allocations because it's a it's a formula that uses a bunch of factors, but it's essentially how many unserved locations are in your state as the numerator and the denominator is how many unserved locations are there in the United States total. Uh, now, this some, I'm simplifying it a bit, but it's that's basically what we're talking about. And the way the program is going to work is uh, the states have to submit a letter of intent and they will be able to, uh, that will unlock some uh, $5 million per state to do planning. And then they can, uh, they're going to submit a preliminary plan to the NTIA that NTIA has to uh, approve. And once they approve that plan, that releases 20% of the money uh, and they can start making sub awards or what they call sub grant awards for projects uh, in their state. And then they got to uh, come around with a final plan or a final proposal and the acceptance of that final proposal unlocks the remainder of their funds. So that's how it works. So states are going to have a lot of discretion about uh, how they run their individual programs. All the details uh, everybody's waiting anxiously for, they'll be in something called the Notice of Funding Opportunity or NOFO. If you want to sound like an insider, you talk about the NOFO. That's due on May 15th. Uh, and that will have all the timelines and the application procedures and the program rules and all that. It's going to be many, many pages of details uh, in that. But um, what's interesting here is if you're a GIS professional, uh, your state is going to have a big chunk of money to do broadband planning work. And a lot of that is mapping related. And um, And it's very interesting because in the past way that broadband funding worked, it was tied to specific units of geography, census blocks, which really don't relate in any meaningful way to broadband networks. Uh, but that was the way the, the mapping from an EFCC operated. And so the eligibility for funds was connected to census blocks. Under this new thing, there is no defined geography. What you're going to be able to do, it's kind of like redistricting. You're going to be able to draw lines or people wanting subgrant awards are going to be able to draw the lines anywhere they like, so long as at least 80% of the locations in that polygon 
meet the unserved or underserved definition for funding. So it's a little bit of game theory, uh, and it makes it a really interesting geospatial problem um, because everybody's going to be trying to game it a little bit to their advantage. The companies that, you know, the ISPs that want to want to tap the funding are going to want to reach the easiest to reach uh, addresses to to tap the fund, and states are going to be on the other side trying to make, make sure that the hardest to reach addresses uh, get included. So it's uh, going to be a little tug of war going on. There. I think it's going to be very, very interesting. Um, and then the other big program is something called the Digital Equity Program. It's a smaller amount of money, but it's still, we're, we're talking about a lot of money, two and three quarter billion. And that's split into two pieces. Um, and it worked, so one piece of it is a, is a formula-based thing to the states, and states are gonna submit a plan about how they're gonna, and digital equity is all about who's getting left out based on income or uh, digital literacy skills or a lack of access to the, uh, to the devices to get online and those sorts of things. Um, but then there's the other half of the program is a competitive grants program. So that's gonna be open to the world. Any, any organization uh, can apply for the competitive grants. That's gonna be a five year, 250 million a year for five years. So a total of one and a quarter uh, billion uh, in that program. And uh, so very interesting. And then, um, you know, the little bit here uh, to kind of bring my piece to a close here is um, there's a lot of GIS data that comes into play uh, in these programs because it's not just about where is the network present and not present, the kind of binary uh, am I served or unserved? That's an oversimplification of what's really what really matters in broadband. What you really need to understand in broadband is what are the factors that make it more expensive to extend in certain areas? And what are the characteristics of the underlying population? Uh, because the barriers aren't just, is the, does the network pass my location? It's, can I afford to get on it? Is there, do I need assistance with digital literacy? Am I, am I, do I not have the right tools and so forth? So all of these things, uh, can, you can go deep into geoanalytics to help prioritize where this funding needs to go. So it's really an exciting time for, for the, uh, for the GIS profession. And if you're not already talking with your state uh, broadband program, uh, they're gonna need your help. I mean, first of all, all of this broadband mapping is for the first time gonna be address-based, location-specific based. So if you're, if you're working in the local level and you have address data, you, the state is gonna need your data so that they can uh, help structure these programs at that level of granularity, at the address level. It's a big leap forward from where we were. All right, so um, again, it's a it's a major good news story, exciting time, and with that, I will stop my share. Thank you, Bill. That was excellent, and and really helps us to understand the broadband side, which I know is on everyone's mind. It's on my mind for sure. Um, so thank you very much. Um, today we also have David Moss, and David is gonna is gonna give us. His perspective, he provides uh, geospatial services to our communities, and I know many of you already know him. David, do you want to take it away? Do you need to be able to share? Yes, I have a few things to share. And so, so mine is a little bit different perspective. Um, I was always the guy looking for more money wherever I was working or GIS area. So about 17 years of GIS experience, uh, I actually worked in the city of Fort Worth uh, for two and a half years doing GIS, and I was actually funded by a grant position the whole time. And I worked under a grant manager. And during that time, this was uh, right around Hurricane Ike uh, area, we were actually able to build a brand new emergency operations center using grant funding. Now, and so I've, Use grant funding in the past before. I've used it during CARES, uh, as well as uh, when I was at Maricopa, we was looking to use it for the ARPA and everything like that. So my presentation is around like, now that you know your organization is getting the money, how do I now get a part of that as a GIS person uh, working for that agency? So share my screen.
All right. So one of the things, uh, can you guys see my screen okay? Yeah. Yeah, we okay. sure can. It's perfect. All right. So one of the things I want to caution folks with is when you're reading grants or federal funding, they rarely state, okay, GIS and mapping and this, you have to do that in this requirement, right? So now broadband is a different one. You know, that's an easy relation. A lot of times with grants, they are strictly for a business standpoint. They're like, oh, we want to determine who's underutilized in this area. We want you to roll out programs to re revitalize this area of town, things of that nature. And there are lots of grant funding out there. So when you do that, then the big part from a GIS standpoint is for you to say, okay, how does that relate to GIS? And then how does that relate to the business or the group that is looking for that grant or federal funding? Also, federal funding is very clear about what you can't use funding for. So they don't, they're not very clear about what you can use it for, but they will tell you, can't use that for revenue. You can't do this. Like they are very good about can't. So that's good news. Um, and one of the reasons I bring that up is, is I was uh, working at my Maricopa County and well, in Fort Worth, I was working in Fort Worth and we were able to buy GPS devices to map where tornadoes landed. So we want to take them and take pictures, but we want the pictures to really correlate right to where the damage happened. So we were able to tie that back to the grant and use GIS and buy these $800, $900 cameras to do that during that time. And so we were able to do that. Also for the CARES funding, I was able to use that at Maricopa to actually cover my ArcGIS Online credits, right? So I'm working with public health to use our local geocoder and Esri's geocoder to get as many of the points geocoded. And we were doing a million points a day at some point, right? Well, that ate credits. And I was able to take that and actually work with Esri to put in their credits for public health and then present that back to our finance manager. And we actually get paid for all those credits for all that geocoding for a year and a half with CARES funding. Now CARES funding didn't say anywhere where you can use credits to take advantage of that, but it said supporting public health. So that's what I'm saying is that's where you wanna work. And also you can work with partners um, as well to help you do that. And so my biggest thing is, is connecting the dots, right? That's where we come in, GIS folks come in, right? The business, public health, um, human services, those groups are usually funded a lot with grant funding. Um, you know, anything helping the community, they don't know where GIS fits. They know I get the funding for our office to do this project and I'm a higher staff potentially. And then this is how the community affected. They don't know, oh, I need this middle piece GIS to then you know, make that all relatable and ha make that happen. And so that's where we come in to work with GIS folks to work with those agencies to make that relation. And if you have a hard time doing that yourself in GIS, that's fine. We have folks, Esri, myself, uh, Bill, that we can help you make that relationship through that. Also, it helps when you're looking at that to have a partner because it helps bring additional credibility if you haven't done it before, but it also takes some of the risk of you and the agency, right? If you're presenting, we want half a million dollars and you've never done this before, but you have a partner in there that can help you, then that helps take some of that risk off. Okay, so, and also one of the things you gotta look at too with federal grants and dollars, at some point you have to show what that money was used for and what's the results you got from the community with that federal funding. Whether it worked well or it didn't, you have to show that. And GIS is great with dashboards and things to show how that worked and how you were able to take advantage of what happened in the community. And then I always like to say, you know, trust the process, right? This is the process that I've worked with and we actually, we help customers today do this with some of the ARPA funding where we had a customer out of uh, Illinois went and replaced their whole front facing GIS with portal using federal dollars. <clears throat> because part of their, the, the grant they were looking at was to help, you know, reflect back, you know, work with the community, engage the community, showcase their results. Well, they didn't have any way of doing that except through, you know, using some of the Esri solutions for that. So first thing would be is gather information like you guys are today, 
So great job of being on here, gathering your information. And then what's your process at your agency for spending the money? Every city and agency has their own process. When I was at the county, we had our process of, we had to put our idea down, we had to do a one pager, you had to get your director to approve that one pager, and then you, that director then would stamp that and send that to the county manager, who then would vote on anything 100K or less, anything higher than that, that the county manager would present that to the board. And then the board would elect to allow to use the money for that. Okay, so understand that. Also, you want to partner with your grant liaison. Most cities and counties have somebody that does that, right? They keep up with a lot of the grants that are coming out. Um, they work with some of the, the agencies that have the grants, that go get grants all the time. Also, you want to work with your finance manager and, of course, with IT. Because, you know, if you want to buy servers or do database work, those things, IT want to be aware, things like that. And also work with your finance manager is important because they a lot of times are engaged with those folks and knowing how much money is coming, how you can address that funding and apply that. So I always say do that. And then also connect the dots, right? Now you gotta, now you have all the information. You're like, okay, I gotta understand how GIS is gonna link everything together. And then you gotta choose a customer executive sponsor. And the reason for that is, is your director can approve of it, but if that GIS is gonna help uh, let's say transportation, or well, you want a transportation director to say, yes, I like this plan. We want to take advantage because now you got your director saying yes and the transportation director saying yes when it goes to your city or council members for them to approve of it. So you have more backing. And then also, like I said, choose a partner, whichever it may be. And your partner could do background work. They don't have to be in the front face and they could be behind the scenes validating work. Like one of the things that we did was, is was we rolled out apps for CARES. We worked with Esri to also validate, you know, the process we were using to make sure we didn't miss anything when we were reflecting some of the data going back out for, you know, who had COVID, who didn't, if they got vaccinated or not, right? We just want to make sure we had all our bases covered. And so you could do that type of work. And then of course, when you do your proposal submittal, right? So you want to make sure you state the issue you're resolving, the business benefits to your agency, with you and identify who's the executive sponsor that has proven that from your customer standpoint. Really state how GIS links everything, state your outcomes and your validation metrics, how you're going to show that everything is working. And then please, please use screenshots of the GIS solutions and examples. You can't say you want to use GIS or replace GIS, but then don't show that in the submittal. Like that doesn't work, right? You got to use that. And so no matter what your process may be for your city, like in this case for the county, it was a one pager. Well, what I did was I did a PowerPoint that went along with the one pager. If people wanted to read it in that, in the PowerPoint, I did all these different things and I showed the apps that we would use. So a person's like, I know what you're talking about, but I'm not quite sure. But then when they see an example of the app, they're like, oh, I like that. So then they automatically want to vote to do that because they like what the outcome is going to look at the end of the day. And then I would present that to my executive sponsor, get their input, my director, get their input, and then package the whole thing. Even though I only needed one pager, I packaged all of it just in case the person wanted to know more details about why I was requesting that funding. And so it worked out well. And then um, I want to say around 2014, 2015, we, um, Human Services was doing a grant, $750,000 grant on providing teen pregnancy services in certain zip codes. So part of the grant submittal to get the money, we actually did a web app showing all the zip codes where there were high pregnancies, where there wasn't, and how we thought we could improve that by doing the services and all that. Now it did not require any mapping or anything. So we did screenshots and we did a link to a public facing map that was just for that grant. And the county got that $750,000 over a three year period. And then once we used GIS to help get it, then we made sure we were putting all the data and the metrics back in the GIS application as they were rolling out the funding. And so it seems like it may be a lot, but a lot of these things you do today, you just may not recognize you're doing it. And so with grants, you just want to make sure you lay, lay that out and move forward with that. And that's all I had for that. 
That's great, David. And and thanks for kind of providing the, the examples that make it real for the folks on the phone, right? I think that that helps to to frame where we're at, right? What are the best next steps? Um, how can people really put themselves in the best position to take advantage of the available funding? I think that that's really important. Um, trying to get off presenting and I'm having a hard time. I can force it. Yes, please. Okay. Thank you. All right, there you are. Okay, so so this is the part of the programming where we really want to see all your faces and have you come off mute. We want to have a robust discussion, right? How how can this discussion really help you with where you're at and what you're trying to achieve? So you all provided some questions in the registration that I'm going to rely on to keep the discussion going. Um, I think it, you know, we've already got one question in the chat, so I think we should start there. And Bill, maybe you could address, um, you could address Brian's question. He wanted to understand for those that are not looking at your chat. Um, oh, let me get back to it. He wanted to understand being able to give feedback to the FCC and what yeah. does that look like and how does that affect funding? You know? Yeah, that's what's, a great question. Best? So thank you for posting that, Brian. So there's really good news. Um, the new mapping method that the FCC is implementing, they're shifting from the old model, which was based on something called Form 477, which is reporting by the carriers at the census block level. Well, that's that's going to go be, be going away. Um, the new method is reporting at, um, actually the carriers are going to submit polygons that represent the areas where they serve at a particular speed and technology. And um, this is, was all laid out in a, in a law that uh, passed Congress in March of 2019 called the Broadband Data Act. So this is, and a provision of the Broadband Data Act that's entirely new is something called a challenge process. So uh, anybody will be able to challenge the accuracy of the map by submitting additional data so if you believe that the, the map uh, misses locations in your state, for example, if you can submit a data set that shows that they missed some locations, um, uh, they, they will have a specified time frame. I think it's 90 days, but don't quote me on that, uh, to evaluate your challenge uh, they and do whatever research they need to do, go back to the ISP whose data they were relying on or whatever, and make a determination to either accept your challenge or reject it. And if they accept your challenge, they're going to immediately fix the map and the data set. And this is not a, a time limited process. It's not like there'll be a quarterly refresh of the map with you know challenges that have been accepted. It's going to be a continuous process over the life of this map. So the map could literally be changing by the day. So that's that's one key part of it. And um, what in our discussions with a lot of the states, what we're helping them do is be prepared to challenge this new FCC map when it comes out. And the biggest piece of data to help with that is a statewide address data set. Because what the FCC now, that this new reporting, uh, the carriers are going to submit these polygons, and these polygons are going to be overlaid on a data set of broadband serviceable locations, which is essentially an address database. And the FCC just contracted or is in the process of contracting for that from a, a commercial third party. And uh, they put an RFP on the street and it was won by a company called CostQuest. So there's a $48 million contract for an ad a nationwide address data set. Um, it's a brand new data set. And this is a brand new use case. Do you think it's going to be perfect when it first appears? I don't. Uh, you know, it's it's a new it's a new kind of reporting for the carriers, being ingested with newly developed systems at the uh, FCC and overlaid with a newly purchased commercial data set. Uh, there's guaranteed to be some issues there, and so smart states are going to be ready to uh, challenge the accuracy of that because remember the funding formulas are based on that map. So to the extent that map misses some areas, you can be uh, increasing the funding allocation to your state by correcting it. So very, very important. And the other thing that the FCC will be uh, supporting is crowdsourcing. 
So you'll be able to note, uh, hey, there's something wrong with my address. You don't necessarily have to submit data through the challenge process. You can uh, online mark up the map through this crowdsource capability that is also a requirement under the Broadband Data Act. So uh, I'll stop there. I don't know if the other panelists are John or uh, David have anything to add. Yeah, we're welcome to take your comments, David. John, did you have anything to add to that question or that response? No, I think I would defer to Bill's expertise. The only thing I would say is don't wait. Like start figuring out who in your office or your area is going to participate and start making a plan. Like don't don't wait to, oh, it's open now I can challenge and now you want to get everybody together and say how we're going to do that. Right? You know, start that now. Yeah, and you might have, you know, for example, if you've done a, if you've done a survey, or if you've, you know, done speed test data gathering, or you've done field mapping to know where the infrastructure is, and of course that statewide address data set that you should have for other purposes anyway, that's going to be a real key. Uh, so th there's lots of data that you can bring to the party here to help make sure that map is is right, and it's going to be up to you to to uh, scrutinize that FCC map and challenge it wherever necessary. Yeah, because I Agreed. would say uh, the cell tower data, I know a lot of you know 911 folks have that already from the providers, things like that for your public safety. So definitely be like, like Bill saying, gather all that data, look at it. If it's not good, start trying to improve it now, what data, and then start playing that process of well, who, who in our group is going to challenge, who's in charge of doing that. Like who are we putting in charge and things like that. So yeah, that's all really great advice. And and for those on the line that are not aware, in Arizona, we have a state broadband office. It is run out of the Arizona Commerce Authority. Um, and my office is collaborating with them on the mapping aspect and gathering the requirements and gathering the, the data. Um, so if you have specific questions over what that looks like and, and how the broadband office is, is addressing the problem, you are welcome to email me. You are welcome to join our calls. We have regular calls with the broadband office to strategize and make sure that we are on the same page. Uh, so we've started working on it, but your input is welcome always. Um, I think that's really important. So. So we do have some other questions that were submitted um, during registration to, to kind of help guide our, our conversation. So I'm looking at them now. What's, and, and John, maybe this is, the, is a good question for you. There's a question about um, the channels used by federal governments to disseminate information on, on what opportunities are out there. Um, and and then I think we get into David's point of being a little creative in how to how to interpret them for geospatial. Do you have advice for folks on what to pay attention to, particularly with all the funds that are coming current right now and in the near future? How do people know what to what to look for and what to look at? What should they be paying attention to? Yeah, Jenna, that's a really good question. And, um, you know, it's been interesting with the programs that have rolled out in the last few years. In a lot of cases, because they wanted to expedite getting funds out to states and local communities, uh, many of these programs just sort of tapped into existing funding pipelines. So, you know, the vast majority of the infrastructure pots of money that are going out are basically just huge plus ups of the money that traditionally goes to states for highway programs or, you know, utility infrastructure, yeah. uh, even broadband programs as Bill alluded to through NTIA are just basically just, you know, massively ballooned numbers of typical programs. Um, so in most cases, I would say, you know, go to a colleague who's familiar with a particular program that you're interested in tapping into. Uh, figure out what the traditional means uh, for submitting an application for the disbursement of monies under those programs, um, you know, may require, uh, you know, picking up the phone and calling somebody within the state government who you usually work with or, uh, you know, calling a, somebody at a county across the, uh, the state. Um, but you may find existing resources that know how to work with a lot of these programs. 
Now, there are, of course, some new sets of guidelines that have been put out by the federal government, uh, by state and local governments around how these specific funds can and should be expended. And that's going to require, you know, sort of a little bit more nuance in reading through uh, programs, figuring out where the opportunity areas lie. Um, and, you know, in some cases, um, I don't want to get into a parochial uh, discussion around ESRI, but we have been willing to sit down with people who are specifically interested in investing in our technology and help them think through, you know, okay, under a specific county guidelines, these are the areas where you might be able to point to uh, investment that you can make through a particular program. Uh, you know, there was the uh, illusion that, that David made around getting the funding for CARES Act for his credits for ArcGIS. We've seen a lot of people be able to do that type of thing through CARES and ARPA funding. Um, and we've actually had a lot of state and localities that have been able to, you know, re-up the funding for their uh, ESRI enterprise agreement for the next five years, even through some of these funding sources. So in a lot of cases, if you can point to the use case for the technology in terms of answering the bell around, you know, COVID related needs, infrastructure, broadband related needs, uh, you then can bring that technology online for the, you know, sort of wider range of use cases. Um, so I would just say, you know, talk to colleagues, look at existing programs and uh, in the types of new programs that are being spun up, look for specific areas where there is uh, geographic expertise required. David, do you have anything to add to John's response? Yeah, yeah John covered it really well. I'll one thing I, I do know, I get a lot of questions asked about, well, what about uh, continued maintenance? Like a lot of times you can't use the federal fundings or the grants for continuing maintenance. Well, that's kind of not accurate. And so what I'll say with that is, is, and, and I've done this in three different job locations. If it's a new product or solution you're getting and the vendor puts in three to five years maintenance up front, you can pay for it all early, right out the gate. So that's what I'm saying is working with your finance manager and knowing how that works, you can do that if they put it in the initial purchase up front that says, oh, you're paying for five years of maintenance. And then you can buy the initial software, the initial service, and pay for the maintenance all at one time. And so knowing those little you know, nuances and then validating that with your the grants liaison and your finance folks, we were able to do that with a lot of uh, things that we were able to get using grant funding and federal dollars because we were getting that for the first time. Usually what it means by like you already purchased it and now you wanna use grant money to keep paying for it every year. Well, they don't allow you to do reoccurring maintenance do a lot of times with federal and grant dollars. So that's what I'm saying, those little nuances can be very particular and can be, can work in your favor if you if you uh, look at it that way. Did you employ a, a specific strategy to learn about where those opportunities were when you were in the public sector? Did you know where to look or were you just connected to the right people to learn uh, about yes. where those opportunities were? And I was uh, connected to the right people. Um, because I was okay. saying when I initially started, I didn't, I knew there was money there, but I didn't know how the whole grant process or the federal process worked. But they have folks that they hire that do that consistently, like, you know, especially in your, like I say, anybody working in those communities, public health, um, you know, human services, like they do that constantly to just run their, their government organization. And so just connecting with them and then just saying, okay, how can I take advantage of that? And then, you know, working with that and learning that over time really worked really well for that. And then my thing is, is when I looked at the grants, what I started reading about is, did it have a location component? Like, is there a location mm -hmm. component or is there data that I would gather and store for you to do what you need to do? So a lot of times uh, we was working with an agency that they use ARPA money to do a whole new bridge. Well, they're like, oh, we don't have a bridge database to store that, we're kind of storing that in Excel. They were like, okay, well, part of that new bridge is we want to have be able to showcase this and validate this and do dashboards so you could track this moving forward. So we we're able to 
tie in getting a database and a server in that whole bridge project they were doing so now they can store all that information and be resilient, right? Because part of the, the, trick, the, the thing is about resiliency. Putting stuff in Excel and on paper isn't resilient. Right. <laughs> That's great. Thank you, David. And, and Bill, I kind of want to go back to, to you because you've spent a lot of time digging into where the opportunities are, how to find the right information, how to how to dissect the thousands and thousands of pages of information mm -hmm. and and distill that information into kind of actionable items, right? So do you have words of advice for folks on, on how do they find the right opportunities and where do they look first? What, is, what do they do? And, you know, yeah. David, I certainly agree with David on finding the right people, but sometimes we need the documents yep. too, right? Yeah, that's a great question. It's a, it's a it's a little difficult to answer because I think you have to you have to be a curious person and ask a lot of questions all the time. I mean, these things aren't going to land in your lap. A lot of times you're gonna you're gonna chase them down. Um, and I've learned a couple of tricks along the way. Uh, one of which is to look for new programs. You know, like. The embedded programs that are just getting a new infusion of money, like the transportation agency, you know, getting, you know, they've got mature systems and, and processes for how they're going to uh, apply for the funds and uh, do all the all the justification and the contract. You're you're not likely to penetrate that. It's the new things that, that appear for the first time, you know, like the broadband mapping uh, that first became available to states in 2009 as a result of the ARA, the American Reinvestment Recovery Act, when we had that recession in, in late 2008. That was, that was something brand new, and it was an opportunity for every state to participate in. So it was like, uh, yeah, I jumped on that one. Um, and in the new, in, like in the Infrastructure Act, there's this $2.75 billion component called the Digital Equity Act. It's a piece of the Infrastructure Act. It's something brand new. And it's going to require a lot of geospatial analytics, and um, it's going to be looking at socioeconomic factors at at address locations. So this is a you know it's a great time to get involved in that. So um, so advice piece of number advice number one is be curious and, and look especially at the new things. And then my second piece of advice is don't rely on anybody else's summary of what these programs are. A, a trick I learned from uh, one of my, my old bosses who was an attorney was always go to the original source, read the language in the law. And, um, and I, I first groaned like, I know I didn't go to law school. I didn't want to go to law school, but you read the, you read the language in these bills. You know, I read the 85 pages that describe the broadband funding in the infrastructure act. And right at the beginning is a, is a, a few paragraphs of purpose that very clearly lays out what the priorities are in the program. And then the next section, which is super important, every time we read one of these bills, I tell people that pay very close attention to the definitions because the words that they use uh, may mean something different than you think they mean in the context of these laws. For example, in the Digital Equity Act, which is again, a 2.75 billion piece of the Infrastructure Act, there's some key definitions in there that relate to geospatial. One of which, one of the definitions, for example, is the covered population. So who are the people that you, you need to do uh, geoanalytics on to identify? And they've got, a, they've got a list of them. Some of them reference other laws, like there's a, there's a category called aging Americans. I didn't know what they meant by an aging American, but it referenced another law, which I had to, you know, luckily online, it's easy to chase these things down. And I was horrified to learn that I'm actually an aging American because it's anyone over age 60. <laughs> That's it. That's the definition of an aging American. You know, citizen over 60. <laughs> Boom. Um, but so this, you know, this shopping list of criteria, uh, I have a clear understanding now because I've read the law. And there's, you know, and there's going to be funding that can be directed to something called community anchor institutions. And I read that definition with great care. And it has a clause at the end that says something like, and any other location determined to serve community needs. That's like <laughs> wide open, you know? 
you can use these these definitions to your advantage because a lot of people are too lazy to go read the original source documents. They're looking at a summary that they found online, you know, the kind of Wikipedia research. Sure. And if you've if you've spent an hour or two looking at the at the thing yourself and know what's really in there, uh, that goes a long, long way in being able to convince the right people uh, to support you and uh, and get that application in. So anyway, that's enough. That's great advice. Um, I really appreciate it. I think that perspective is really helpful, right? It's <clears throat> we all know that this is kind of an uphill climb, right? If we want to access federal funding, if we want to support our programs, it's kind of an uphill climb. But it helps to have a little bit, um, I suppose, a pun intended, of a map to get there, right? What are the best steps? Um, so thank you for that. Um, we do have some questions in the chat and and I want to get there, but I also want to talk about our our audience that's here. So we have a pretty varied audience. We definitely have county and local government folks and state government folks, but we also have private industry on the line. And one of our questions that was submitted through the registration was was trying to kind of get at where do, where's their role, right? So what are the ways in which Small um, private companies can can maybe participate and take advantage of the of the federal funding opportunities. I'll open that up to any of the three of you. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Are they a supportive mechanism? Is there opportunities for them to support their geospatial needs? What does that look like? Um, I could take a take a crack at that. So yeah, you know, AppGeo where I work is a small company. We're about forty people. Um, and so this kind of two levels of work that we're chasing in the broadband space. One is is kind of to help states with their what they need to be prepared to to take advantage of this money. So it's the mapping work, you know, it's the broadband plan, it's having the data sets ready to challenge the new FCC map and those sorts of activities. And um, and then the other is, you know, uh, states are putting out RFPs to build capabilities uh, around uh, running these programs. So of course we uh, we end up uh, writing proposals uh, in response to a lot of RFPs that states uh, put out for that work. So yeah, uh, kind of a couple of angles. It's certainly, um, you know, this money is not just flowing out to governments. I mean, uh, in in a great many of the cases, it ends it ends up resulting in contract opportunities that are, you know, competitive contracting opportunities. Yeah, that's great. Um, sure. What about you, David or John? Do you have anything to add to Bill's response on that? I would just say quickly, you know, one thing that I think is a real opportunity for any size business in this is this is an unprecedented amount of funding, as several of us has, have said. And, you know, there is so much that states, localities, utilities, uh, transit authorities, airports need to take on under these various laws that they may feel challenged to get everything done. So if you're, you know, a small or medium sized business that, you know, can get a really good solution put in place for, you know, uh, tackling a state's broadband challenge or you know, addressing what a transit authority needs to do to understand demographic changes and how that will impact, you know, what they can do with their infrastructure planning. Uh, by all means, you know, go to those entities that you regularly partner with or strike up a new relationship and, you know, present your, your plan to them, explain why it's a viable option. And I think in some cases they may feel, you know, gratified that somebody has come to them with a good idea that may take some of the weight off their shoulders. So I think this is a real opportunity for any type of organization, uh, be it uh, governmental or external uh, in the private sector. So I think it's a good question. And I think by all means, people should try to tackle this challenge. Thanks, John. David, do you have anything to add? Uh, I will see where we also help and there's a lot of folks just taking the opportunity to upgrade their infrastructure and in situations where they couldn't do certain things because they didn't have the funding. And so just helping them connect the dots is like, you know, you know, we, you know, do, do helping them actually do the work, but also helping them understand where that could be uh, utilized or how they, you know, who they need to talk to in their organization and things like that. So 
That's where we're seeing it going. And it's, it's starting to move and, and it's all size agencies are needing assistance to do that. Like with the addressing, right? You're gonna do it from a state level. Well, you need to have the local address data, you know, tuned and ready to go. And if they're struggling in that area with two people, well, if they couldn't do it before, what makes you think they're gonna be able to do it now, even though the money is available? Because more of bodies. A lot of times we're seeing that people need bodies and unfortunately right now, GIS is is good that it's hot, but it's also good in the sense not good in the sense of it's hard to find quality staff to do a lot of the work that needs to get done right now. Well, and sometimes there's a time issue, right? Um, so it's harder to bring on someone and train them. Sometimes the path of least resistance is contracting. That, that helps. Um, so thank you for all your input on that. Um, one of the questions that was put into the chat by um, our DEMA folks, so that's our Department of Emergency Management, they often, you probably are aware that, that most emergency management uh, at the state level coordinate across different jurisdictions, right? So their question is, what wisdom do you have to help coordinate efforts for funding that impact multiple agencies to support a combined effort and not individual efforts by one agency? How, how does the funding work in that context? and what things should should they be paying attention to? Um, and I'll open it to any of you. I don't I don't know who would like to take the lead on that. So Jen, I, I really think this is an excellent question. And you know, I will tell you one thing that, that Jack Dangerman really believes in strongly and one thing that we try to carry forth in our messaging that we talk to the federal government about, state and local governments, you know, GIS is a crucial, crucial tool for coordination, be it on an interagency basis, an intergovernmental basis, uh, you know, inside the government to outside the government involving the private sector. You can do so much by linking GIS systems, sharing data across portals, uh, you know, putting together combined systems that help uh, various types of organizations understand challenges, gain situational awareness, so, uh, you know, really, I think it's easy to sell the notion uh, in the value of doing this. It may just take uh, getting buy-in from the appropriate level folks at the various agencies to, you know, do that work together. Um, and a lot of times that will take, you know, real sort of guidance and foresight from uh, leaders within state or federal government. Um, I, I'll just give you a quick example on the federal side. Uh, with the implementation of the infrastructure bill, Pete Buttigieg at the Transportation Department and former Mayor Mitch Landrieu, who's now the White House's infrastructure coordinator, have made very clear that they are looking at this as a whole of government challenge. And, you know, they're directing in the implementation of the infrastructure uh, portion of this funding discussion, you know, that agencies really think uh, across their own lines of effort and, you know, with their fellow agencies about, you know, what are the ways we can get 40% of funds directed to underserved communities through the Biden administration's, you know, equity efforts? Or, you know, how can we work together to put in place permitting solutions for a lot of these big infrastructure challenges? So, you know, there are plenty of good examples out there of leaders who have really hit on this point of the need for interagency coordination. And I think it's just, you gotta get to the right person at the right level who can sell this to their partners in other agencies. There's such an easy case to be made for it. And I really encourage you to evangelize it. Thanks, John. One thing I'll state with that too is, why is it important to the local level? So when you're going to somebody and you need them to do some work, right? You don't want to go to them and say, all right, I need you to do this on top of all the other work you got, do this first. You have to go and say, why is it important to them? And then what do they need from me to then do this for me? Okay, so when you're looking at that, right, each agency is going to have their own need for whatever reason. And then you want to be like, all right, I know I'm going to Maricopa. They're going to have this data. It's going to be easy. They got staff. You know, we can work together on that. But if I go to Mojave, well, I know they got two GIS people over there, and what are they struggling with that maybe I could provide support for in return 
to get what I need from them back. And I would say, do your homework first. Like, don't go, like, understand, okay, if they need funding, where will we get the money from in our department or in our state agency to give that to them? Who would they need to contact? Do they got paperwork? Like, have everything ready to go. So when you go in there, the only way you're going to get them to say no to you is by saying, I don't care about what you want to do, and I ain't doing it no matter what. And so uh, that's why I always say, like, sometimes people, when you work with larger agencies, they want to be like, well, we want to get together, then we're going to decide who's going to do this. Like, if you go to them with solutions and answers, you get them to easily agree to help you. And then also when they do, when they do provide that data back, you know, shoot them some shout outs, you know, send an email to their boss, say, hey, great work. We appreciate you. We appreciate things you do. All that stuff make people want to help you when they're not necessarily required to do that. And I just think when you work with large, when you're working with multiple agencies, um, that's where I think it falls down uh, from that standpoint sure. when I've worked with multiple agencies like that. Yeah, David, could you follow up on that too? I know that you had led in, in your previous life as, as Maricopa County GIO, you had led multiple efforts across agencies and across departments, what's the funding piece of that? What considerations, you know, in looking at collaborative projects, what are the funding considerations? If they're gonna leverage federal grants, is there, you know, I would assume there's a need for a primary, right? Yes. But is there a creative process for making sure that everyone gets the funds they need through that grant process? And, and I don't know if you have strategies you could offer around yeah. that. Yeah, so a lot of that too, when we were doing it at the county, because um, I, I even know like we did, we helped us, uh, I want to say some of the school districts, we sent out laptops and everything to the school districts for cares and things like that. A lot of times when you're getting that, you know, coming up with a good process to try to make it, if you don't have one, make it equal so they can get the funding. A lot of that people know how they're going to dial out money already. So you don't usually have to do that. But the issue is, is that local agency or the agency you work with, they may not know, oh, well, how is that being done? So they don't know how they're going to get funding and then where is it going? Okay. So if you have that information, you can say, okay, here's how it's going to be dialed out and you're going to get so much here to help you. We can help you apply that or you can ask them like, hey, what would you need from us to then be a participant in this? Um, I know when I was at, uh, when I was in Houston as well, in uh, Harris County, we were doing project for call sharing. I wanted to buy building footprints. Well, I needed it for one purpose. 911 needed it for addressing. So I went to them and said, hey, here's how you can use building footprints for addressing. Would you be willing to do that? They're like, yes. And I'm like, well, how much, are, how much is that worth to you? How much would you be willing to pay to do, make that happen? And so we were able to do that. So, um, I think that's where the, the, the piece is, is when you work with the agencies, each agency has their own um, value of why they want to participate and you have to sure. make sure you're talking to that. Yeah, that makes sense. That totally makes sense. Bill, do you have anything to add to this particular topic of like the shared funding across agencies to meet multiple needs and any yep. strategies? I most certainly do, Jenna. <laughs> so, you know, uh, the discipline of GIS is dis different than a lot of others in that we naturally need to collaborate. You know, the, the, uh, almost no GIS person has all the data they need. You're, you're tapping other people's resources. That's just standard operating procedure in the world of GIS. And so, in our world, having a network of colleagues that you, you're working with and collaborating with keep, already puts you in a great position to be able to take advantage of a shared uh, funding application to go after a grant, for example, because you already have something really important, which is these relationships with your peers in the other agencies. And, you know, the currency of collaboration is trust. And if you've been working with people previously and, and you've built that trust, uh, it's gonna be a natural thing to uh, feel comfortable, you know, pursuing a, another project together. And that is that is so, so important. So, you know, just 
uh, in your daily work, you've, you're, you're building a network, you're building relationships, you're establishing trust. And uh, it's like putting money in the bank. I don't, I don't like to think of it as, okay, you know, I, the, the withdrawals equal the deposits, that, you know, but every time you're helping a colleague, you're, you're actually making a deposit in a trust bank. And, um, and that's, that's something you're going to be able to uh, make a withdrawal at some point when you're trying to do something collaborative. And that's, that's how, that, that, in the real world, that's how stuff gets done. I really like that analogy. Thanks. I couldn't agree more. Um, and, and I would say that Arizona really does have a very rich geospatial community that's very connected. So, so that makes sense to me. That's great. Um, one of the, one of the questions in the chat kind of focused more on natural resources. So the beginning, one of you, and I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't take note. Um, mentioned that there was some funding available for water, wastewater projects, some other things. And we all know that there is a big focus on, on climate too, coming down the pike from, from the feds. Um, are there more details on how, what funding is available for natural resource based um, projects and, and how that might tie in? Does that tie into the infrastructure bill? Does that you know, I, I think I read recently the Map Lands Act has passed and is awaiting the president's signature. So is there is there a different path that folks need to look at for the natural resources side? And um, I think, Bill, if you want to start and then we'll go to the other panelists, that'd be great. Yeah, thank you. And I was the one that mentioned that because uh, that is a category in the in the ARPA funds, the 350 billion that was rolled out to states in June. So again, most of ARPA was intended to backfill state coffers that had been depleted in dealing with the COVID pandemic, but there was a category of infrastructure funds and, uh, and it included three things, water, wastewater, and broadband. And so if you wanna understand how ARPA can be applied for water and wastewater, there is a document on the treasury website that gives the rules for how the ARPA funds can be applied. I, I'm not personally familiar with the water and wastewater part of that. I went right to the broadband <laughs> when I was looking at it to, to understand it. So I, I know how ARPA works for broadband, but not for water and wastewater. And I presume, and perhaps John can speak to this, I presume there's uh, uh, water and wastewater eligibility in spades in the Infrastructure Act, although I, I don't have any of the details on that. Thanks, Bill. John, do you have do you have something to add? Yeah, thanks, Bill. So, you know, it does primarily come through the broadband, or excuse me, the infrastructure bill, uh, that water and wastewater funding. And a lot of it was, uh, you know, direct uh, plus ups to programs that the federal government wanted to make because of the terrible situation we saw in Flint and so many other communities that were impacted by, you know, lead pipes, degrading water systems, and, you know, situations where communities here in this, you know, first nation, could not get access to clean water for one reason or another. And it was causing, you know, real significant health problems for, for their communities. Um, so, you know, the, the, the infrastructure bill is definitely the place to look for that. Uh, and again, a lot of those programs were just sort of the standard uh, Department of Energy and related uh, EPA programs that are typically uh, going to those types of areas, but they just got huge plus up numbers. So I would encourage uh, the individual who submitted the question to go talk to the folks who typically work with, you know, EPA, Department of Energy, water grants, uh, and really sort of figure out how your locality utilizes those and, and how you might be able to, uh, to get an opportunity around that, that area. That's great. Thanks, John. David, did you have anything to add? Any other suggestions? Uh. No, I think they, they covered it extremely well. So. All right. Perfect. Um, so, so, Bill, I'm going to go back to you. There was a question in the chat um, relating to the infrastructure investment jobs act, right? So the newest, the newest mm -hmm. funding. Um, and it probably any of you can answer this as well, but let's start with Bill. So. It's, it mentions in the first part, Title I and tribal transportation. So do you know if, if the Bureau of Indian Affairs is, is gonna be the one primarily coordinating that, or 
is there going to be opportunity for state and local governments to be coordinating with the tribal folks to get them the grant? How is that working? Okay, I, I actually cannot answer that question. So I did uh, oh, pull down no a P I did pull down a PDF of the, the full text of that act. It's 1043 pages. <laughs> Uh, and if you've if you've ever read any of this legislation, it's not like you know reading a Mark Twain book. You know, it's uh it's full of legalese and footnotes, and uh, the formatting is kind of funky, and it, so it's not an easy read. Uh, so I skipped ahead uh, to uh, the broadband yep. section, which is 85 yep. pages. Okay. There is there is a tribal emphasis, by the way, uh, in lots of the programs. Um, yep. What, what we're seeing is, you know, kind of um, an equity slant to much of the funding, you know, um, making sure that, that we're being inclusive in the funding. I, that's kind of a theme I see repeatedly. So, uh, you know, the broadband money, for example, has a there's a specific section of that that talks about uh, tribal broadband and how to how to include that in your state broadband plan and how your sub grants are going to work because the, the eligibility criteria are actually different in tribal areas than they are in non-tribal areas for the money. Uh, so I presume what I read about broadband is going to be similar in the other in the other sections of the act, but I can't speak to specifically to the transportation piece of it. Thanks, Bill. Sorry to put you on the spot. Um, I made right. an assumption, but I yeah, that's <laughs> great. Um, and one of our other panelists, do you want to speak to this in the tribal aspects of, of the infrastructure bill that's coming, John? Um, you know, I mean, I, I'll just say very briefly, Jen, I know uh, with obviously the some of the appointments that the Biden administration has made, there's been a, a new emphasis on tribal communities that we've never seen before in terms of the leadership of our country. Obviously, the uh, the Secretary of the Interior, Secretary Holland, is the first Native American uh, to serve in a cabinet position. And, um, you know, we, we've we seen real significant emphasis in every major law that's been passed during the Biden administration to really the, make sure that these tribal communities do have sort of full access to uh, programs and, and opportunities for investment. Um, if someone does have a specific question or wants to get into a discussion, I can certainly something up with our uh, tribal communities liaison, a woman named Ann Taylor. Um, so I'd be happy to have folks reach out to me if they want to dig in on that a little bit. That's really helpful, John. Thank you. I think I think all of us that have had any any experience with funding and these big programs, at least in Arizona, tribal always comes up, right? And and it's one of the more sensitive and difficult facets for us to approach. So I appreciate your your suggestions. Um, and and Bill, I don't know if you saw in the chat, but Brian changed his question from the infrastructure bill to to the broadband tribal funding for broadband. I don't know if you have anything different to add. Um, well, uh, but yeah, I can expand a little bit on that. So um, I think when he was asking the question initially, he asked if the Bureau of Indian Affairs, uh, you know, had the lead right. or something like that. Um, the way it right. works for broadband is BIA is not the lead. For, you know, it's not like there's a separate handling of the broad uh, of the broadband funding for tribal areas. The way the BEAD program, that broadband uh, equity and deployment piece, the 42 and a half billion that's in the Infrastructure Act, that's really infrastructure money for broadband. The way that it works is it's a funding formula to the states. The state submits a plan. Part of that plan is going to be how they deal with the tribal areas. So the state is in the driver's seat on, but NTIA has to approve that plan. And I'm sure NTIA will not uh, approve a plan that doesn't adequately cover the tribal components of it. But it's not a it's not a federal BIA. Uh, kind of leadership thing, or it's not like the tribes uh, can go after the money separately. The state is going to be in control of the of the program under the approval of NTIA, and then they're going to make subgrant awards. Some of those subgrants might go to tribes, or might go to contractors focused on delivery of broadband services to tribal lands. Um, but it's not a separate pot of money. Uh, under under separate program rules for the tribes. I hope that I hope that answers your question, Brian. 
Yeah, I think that's probably pretty helpful, Bill. Thank you. So we've got about five minutes left. Um, as we're as we're wrapping up, I wondered if if you all want to share a few words of wisdom before we leave. Um, and and David, I'll pick on you first. Do you want to share a few words of wisdom as we wrap up and best next steps? for folks on the call? Yeah, the, the one thing I will say is uh, when, you're, when you're looking at the, you know, what you can do with federal funding and grant funding, it's, uh, it can be great in the areas of what you can apply. So, you know, I know I give a prior example is in security. Well, it says, okay, you got to have all this great security. There's a lot of cybersecurity and resilience for that. Well, let's say your GIS environment is running on all equipment, you're not doing any um, you know, multi-factor authentication, you're not using all the security best practices. Well, you could use that funding to say, hey, we're upgrading this to apply to the security standards to make our GS resilient to assist in these areas of the business. So you have the ability to tie GIS to just about everything in there. You just have to use, you know, Put, connect the dots and then work with your, your personnel. Because think about it, right? That has to get approved by everybody above you. So if you say this is how it works and everybody agrees that you're city and county, well, then you guys are all in the same boat together. If they don't agree, they're not going to approve it. So you won't get the money anyway. So don't, don't always think that you, you, know, you don't have other folks to assist you. And don't always think that if it's not stated black and white that you can't take advantage of. Thanks, David. That's wise words. Um, John, do you have any any parting thoughts for the group? Yeah, thanks, Jenna. So, I mean, I would just say really quickly, uh, obviously, this is an incredibly, uh, you know, unprecedented opportunity for states and localities and other organizations to tap into these funding sources. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity Jenna gave us uh, today to join the call. And I, I threw my email into the chat. I'm always more than happy to engage with folks around these questions. And please don't hesitate to, to call on myself or my colleagues at Esri uh, in any way we might be able to help uh, as you really you know, try to look to tap on, on the, some of these resources moving forward. Thank you, John. That's, that's really helpful. And Bill, we'll give our last two minutes to your Ooh, words of wisdom. Wow, I get the, I get the last word. That's great. Uh, and I just threw my email and, and cell number in the chat as well. And now I'm always happy to talk to people. Um, I, I'll be repeating myself, but I, I really want to stress how important it is to do your homework, read the, you know, that you don't need to read the whole 1049 pages of the Infrastructure Act. You, you care about some you're a transportation person or an environmental person or an equity person or a broadband person. Read that piece of it. And here's what I promise you, you're going to be, you're going to find yourself at some point in a meeting with people talking about how they can use this money. And if you've read that section of the law, you will be the most knowledgeable person in the room. <laughs> and you will be, you will have an opportunity to correct people's misperceptions about what's eligible and what's not eligible. You say, well, wait a minute, the definition includes do, 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 do. And uh, all of a sudden, all eyes will be on you. <laughs> And that's a great, great place to be in. Um, and uh, that's how opportunities happen. So, um, so read the read the law. That's great, Bill. Well, thank you, all three of you. You have been just very insightful for us. I'm really grateful for the time that you've offered the community in Arizona and your wisdom and insights. It's really, it's really good as we try to wrap our arms around our opportunities for funding and expanding our programs. So thank you very much. Um, I hope you have a great day. Thanks. Enjoy. Thanks, all. Yep. Thank you. Thanks everybody on the call. I'm glad that you were able to join us. Um, yeah, take care. Thank you so much for your time.